It's, uh, it's funny to hear all the stuff I've done, and most, most people say, God, can't you hold a job? Um, <clears throat> so I'm an instructional technologist. So I get a lot of this, like, what the heck is that? Well, I teach people how to use the technology they need to use every day for their jobs and for their educations. So what is technology? So most of us know what that is, right? We talk about it all the time. Well, I don't think we do really truly understand what we mean when we say technology or how that impacts the way we relate to it or, in fact, how we, how we teach it. So my favorite definition of technology is from the Oxford English Dictionary. It is the use of scientific knowledge for practical purposes. The key word being practical. By the way, practical is um, having to be concerned with the actual doing of something rather than sort of theory or ideas. So these practical technologies, they make, our way, make their way into our daily life all the time. Sometimes they can be quite disruptive. Now, you know, we're a pretty adaptable species, so we, kinda, we just kind of go with the flow, right? Eventually we adopt them, move ourselves forward. But historically, um, disruptive technologies, let's say like uh, writing or the printing press or uh, the steam engine, they've had the potential to completely change the way resources get allocated within a society. So in 1981, the IBM PC was introduced. At that time, we saw the, the beginning of something that I think was going to have as large an impact on the human condition as, well, the wheel, or maybe even fire. We have a, a complicated relationship with technology. Think about the, um, our psyche, all right? And look at our stories. We create the machines in an act of divine inspiration, all right? We think of them as our perfect children. And then we come to resent them. And then we come to fear them. And then we try to subjugate them, and then they kill us. <laughs> so if you think about our stories, every time a computer reaches sentience, what's the first thing that happens? It tries to get rid of us. So that is a very complicated relationship we have with technology. So into this relationship, I'm going to propose that there are three main groups. Now, the first group are people like myself. We were the people who got in very early, and we kind of understood it. We, we didn't think this technology stuff was so scary or so, so weird, so difficult. So we kind of formed a cabal. You know, we had our own secret rituals. Oh, we even had a coded language. We talked about IOs and PCs and CDs, and we rammed and we rommed, and oh my God, we fell in love with DAP and HIJK LMNOP. Right. <laughs> then came the Stanford Business School, right? The beginning of the Silicon Valley, and boom, out of the basement we came, and now we're called technologists. <laughs> so now as the second group, I like to call them dabblers. Uh, dabblers, they're pretty open to new things. They'll, they'll experiment with technology. They'll use it for a variety of things. But I have to admit, sometimes the solutions are a little unorthodox. <laughs> However, I will say that it does make a darn good cup holder. The next group is those for whom technology is an incredible challenge. So now think about this. 30 years ago, the computer was not mainstream at all very much on the fringe. Today, well, it's embedded in everything from banking to personal communication. We have smartphones. We're going to have smart houses, smart cars, smart underwear, smart pants, <laughs> smart socks. We are the only thing in that equation that is not smart. <laughs> With technology being so pervasive, right, this group runs the risk of having access to just basic, fundamental resources cut off because they don't have the technological skills to be able to access them. Now, people say, oh, pff, that's crazy. Really? 
When's the last time anybody here saw a payphone? So what do we do when the world is smarter than us? Well, as educators, it's our job to be able to prepare people for what is coming next. And I gotta tell you, I've been doing this for a decade, and we suck at this. <laughs> so, what do we do? Let me see if this is familiar to you. Anybody who's ever had any tech support experience. <clears throat> hey, laddie! I'm having trouble. I've been trying to eat my oats all morning and it's not working. I think it's defective. <sighs> well, um, have you tried putting it down and picking it back up? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Have you tried a different one? I hear the updated version is much, much better. I <laughs> laddie, I have. Well, you know, we don't have a lot of experience with these. You know, they're just... Hold on, the person who does isn't here right now. Uh, is Skylar still here? You know, she has experience with these. You know, these really are out of date. And they're not the standard. Uh, you should try using one of these. I couldn't eat my oats with that. Well, maybe you should eat eggs. Really? We can do better. Each of us has to negotiate technology and tools every day. We've been having to do it since we got up on two legs and started walking. I mean, think about it. A stick. A stick into lava to make fire, apparently. A rock, a car, a vacuum, even your toothbrush is technology. And what, well, we're fine with all of that? All right, I probably can't see your hands, but let me show hands how many people took driver's ed and learned how to drive in driver's ed. Whoa, a lot of people. All right, so back in my day, it was a Dodge, Do no, it wasn't a Dodge, it was a Dodge Aspen. All right, probably most of you, it was a Honda or a Toyota. So if it was, you don't sit behind the wheel of, say, a Ford and go, Oh my God! What is this? The, the wheel's in the wrong place, different color. Oh my God. You don't. You can deal with it. However, you put a Windows Internet Explorer user in front of Safari on a Mac. Oh my God, stand back and watch the fireworks. <laughs> So, what do you do about this? Well, thing one, it is just a tool. Think of it as a fancy pencil that does not need sharpening. But like any other tool, remember, the most important thing about it is what you make with it. Painters paint. So, <clears throat> like most other institutions, we spent the last, I don't know, two decades putting in, well, oh, computer labs, buying computers and software, and then recently buying devices. The problem is, institutionally, we still think about technology in a framework that is being dictated to us by the people who sell us the technology. That never works out. And their message is really simple. Buy our product, and you will be an expert. Let me tell you, anybody who's ever done anything that requires even the tiniest bit of skill will tell you that's a lie. Years ago, I figured I would go buy a set of tools, and I would make myself a butcher block table. Now, for the few seconds it actually stood on its own, it looked drunk. <laughs> then it fell onto the floor and broke into a lot of pieces and then dissolved in shame. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you own a copy of Final Cut Pro, that does not make you a filmmaker. 
It just means you own a copy of Final Cut Pro. That's it. Skills over software. No tool can replace a skill. Now think about it. A hammer can't build a house without the arms to swing it. An aria cannot soar without a voice to give it wings. Think how we teach software and how we teach technology. So here, we will offer a Photoshop class. That's like offering a class in stove, <laughs> or screwdriver, or car. You don't teach like that. You teach a class in image manipulation using Photoshop. Now, I know that sounds like just a minor distinction, but it's not, and it makes a big difference. One puts the emphasis on the tool. The other one puts the emphasis on the user making something, and then it encourages that user to have a flexible approach to technology and allows them to basically take in whatever other technology or challenge they're faced. Now, look at software. You could lay them all side by side, open them up, and you're going to notice something. They all have the same icons. They all have the same menus. They all function essentially the same way. Right? They do have some minor differences. But let's say, let's say you were to go to England and try to drive a car. Now, the steering wheel is going to be on the opposite side of what you're used to. But the steering wheel still works. The doors open and close. The accelerator makes it go, and the brake makes it stop. So when you decide to teach skills over software, there's really just three things you have to remember. First, what you need to do is explain what the tool is and what you're making. Second, understand the metaphor that the tool's using. All of these tools use a metaphor. In fact, they're designed with all their tools being analogous to something in the real world. You know, that's why the icons are things like erasers and pencils and pens. When you understand the metaphor, it is easier to teach and it's easier to learn. And then finally, focus on the end product, right? That's really the most important part. When somebody has, has say, mastery over this tool or that tool, it's not as important as getting to the end. It's like you can know how to drive. Believe me, if you don't know where you're going, that don't mean jack. <laughs> All right? There's no free lunch. This is for educational institutions. I'm going to tell you, stop pandering. So it's great to get free software given to you by a company, especially, I, mean, I understand, when schools are having troubles with budget, it can be a boon. But I understand something, ain't nothing free. Right? You get something free, you are allowing that product or brand to be put in front of a captive audience, your students. So an institution might think, oh, well, we're doing what's best for the institution. Ah, I say we ask the question, are we doing what's best for the student? To me, creating flexible learners who can take in any situation and just roll with it is much more important than a budget line item or standardization on any one kind of tool. But it's more than just free advertising that bugs me about it. Right? By, using, by keying on a single tool, that puts the focus on it, and then that means when somebody thinks of word processing, it becomes synonymous with Word or Office. Or they think of image processing. It becomes synonymous with Photoshop. That leads to a poverty of language that falsely limits people's choices because they think there is nothing else set by this artificial standard. Well, let me tell you something. The world is not standard. It is a big, messy pile of competing ideologies. When someone has the flexibility to look at it, they can see this, 
and they can pull these common threads together. And their first reaction is curiosity and understanding, not fear. Fear keeps people huddled in the darkness. Understanding, well, it promotes the drive to create and build and discover. Thank you.